And I would suggest that tonight, part of the import of tonight, is that the senator from Kentucky is standing with millions of Americans who are frustrated by politicians in Washington who are unwilling to rock the boat, who are unwilling to stand for change. And I'm reminded that change can sometimes seem hopeless. Indeed, I mentioned that the desk I'm standing at was previously occupied by Barry Goldwater. I have yet to acquire, but I intend to acquire, a leather-bound copy of Conscience of a Conservative, which I intend to keep in this desk. When Barry Goldwater became a national leader, his views were thought impossible to receive a wide audience. The views instead that were in the ascendancy were the views of the left, that government control of the economy of our lives was the proper and right direction for our nation. And yet I'm reminded of someone else, like the senator from Kentucky, who gave a speech on October 27, 1964. He said the following, I have spent most of my life as a Democrat. I recently have seen fit to follow another course. I believe that the issues confronting us cross party lines. Now, one side in this campaign, the campaign in 1964 for president, has been telling us that the issues of this election are the maintenance of peace and prosperity. The line has been used, we've never had it so good. But I have an uncomfortable feeling that this prosperity isn't something on which we can base our hopes for the future. No nation in history has ever survived a tax burden that reached a third of its national income. Today, 37 cents out of every dollar earned in this country is the tax collector's share. Ah, those were the days. And yet our government continues to spend $17 million a day more than the government takes in. Would that we could say today the government spends only $17 million a day more than it takes in. We haven't balanced our budget in 28 out of the last 34 years. We've raised our debt, debt limit three times in the last 12 months. I will remind you this speech was given in 1964, not last week. And now our national debt is one and a half times bigger than all the combined debts of all the nations of the world. We have $15 billion in gold in our treasury. We don't own an ounce. Foreign dollar claims are $27.3 billion. And we have just announced that the dollar of 1939 will now purchase 45 cents of its total value. Again, a scenario with which we are quite familiar. As for the peace that we would preserve, I wonder who among us would like to approach the wife or mother whose husband or son has died in South Vietnam and ask them if they think this is a peace that should be maintained indefinitely. Do they mean peace or do they mean that we just want to be left in peace? There can be no real peace while one American is dying someplace in the world for the rest of us. We're at war with the most dangerous enemy that has ever faced mankind in his long climb from the swamp to the stars. And it's been said that if we lose that war, and in doing so lose this way of freedom of ours, history will record with the greatest astonishment that those who had the most to lose did the least to prevent it from happening. Well, I think it's time we asked ourselves if we still know the freedoms that were intended for us by the Founding Fathers. This next section is a section particularly dear to my heart. It was given before I was born. Not too long ago, two friends of mine were talking to a Cuban refugee, a businessman who had escaped from Castro. And in the midst of his story, one of my friends turned to the other and said, we don't know how lucky we are. And the Cubans stopped and said, how lucky you are. I had some place to escape to. And in that sentence he told the entire story. As I turn and see the junior senator from Florida, I know he and I both know 
as I hope does every member of this body, just how precious and fragile the freedom is that we enjoy in this country. As President Reagan continued in that speech, if we lose freedom here, there's no place to escape to. This is the last stand on earth. And this idea that government is beholden to the people, that it has no other source of power except the sovereign people, is still the newest and most unique idea in all the long history of man's relation to man. This is the issue of this election. Whether we believe in our capacity for self-government or whether we abandon the American Revolution and confess that a little intellectual elite in a far distant capital can plan for our lives better than we can plan them ourselves. You and I are increasingly told that we have to choose between a left or right. Well, I'd not like to suggest there's no such thing as left or right. There's only up or down. Up, man's old age dream, the ultimate in individual freedom consistent with law and order, or down to the ant heap of totalitarianism. And regardless of their sincerity, their humanitarian motives, those who would trade freedom for security have embarked on this downward course. Given the topic of this discussion, the asserted power of the president to take the life out of a U.S. citizen on U.S. soil without due process of law, that last portion bears reading again. Those who would trade our freedom for security have embarked on this downward course to the ant heap of totalitarianism. In this vote harvesting time, they use terms like the great society, or as we were told a few days ago by the president, we must accept a greater government activity in the affairs of the people. But they've been a little more explicit in the past than among themselves. And of all of the things I now will quote have appeared in print. These are not Republican accusations. For example, they have voices that say, quote, the Cold War will end through our acceptance of a not undemocratic socialism. Another voice says, the profit motive has become outdated. It must be replaced by the incentives of the welfare state. Or, quote, our traditional system of individual freedom is incapable of solving the complex problems of the 20th century. Senator Fulbright has said at Stanford University that the Constitution is outmoded. He referred to the president as, quote, our moral teacher and our leader. And he says he is hobbled in his task by the restrictions of power imposed on him by this antiquated document. Let me read that one again, too, because that also is very applicable to the discussion this evening. He referred to the president as, quote, our moral leader and our, our moral teacher and our leader. And he says he is, quote, hobbled in his task by the restrictions of power imposed on him by this antiquated document, the Constitution. He must, quote, be freed so he can do what he knows is best. And Senator Clark from Pennsylvania, another articulate spokesman, defines liberalism as meeting the material needs of the masses through the full power of centralized government. Well, I for one resent it when a representative of the people refers to you and me the free men and women of this country as, quote, the masses. <laughs> that is a term we haven't applied to ourselves in America. But beyond that, the, quote, full power of our centralized government, this was the very thing the Founding Fathers sought to minimize. They knew that governments don't control things. A government can't control the economy without controlling people. And they know that when a government sets out to do that, it must use force and coercion to achieve its purpose. They also know, these founding fathers, that outside of its legitimate functions, government does nothing as well or as economically as the private sector of the economy. Now, we have no better example of this than government's involvement in the farm economy over the last 30 years. Since 1955, the cost of this program has nearly doubled. 
One-fourth of farming in America is responsible for 85% of the farm surplus. Three-fourths of farming is out of the free market and has known a 21% increase in the per capita consumption of all its produce. And I'm going to skip further along. to the end of this speech, which I will confess, not unlike the speeches given on this floor, was not a short speech. I will move to the end where President Reagan continued and said, Those who would trade our freedom for the soup kitchen of the welfare state have told us they have a utopian solution of peace without victory. They call their policy accommodation, and they say we'll only avoid any direct confrontation with the enemy. He'll forget his evil ways and learn to love us. We cannot buy our security, our freedom from the threat by committing an immorality as so great as saying to a billion human beings now enslaved behind the Iron Curtain, give up your dreams of freedom because to save your skins, we're making a deal with your slave masters. Alexander Hamilton said, a nation which can prefer disgrace to danger is prepared for a master and deserved one. Now let's set the record straight. There's no argument over the choice between peace and war. But there's only one guaranteed way you can have peace, and you can have it in the next second. Surrender. Admittedly, there's a risk in any course we follow other than this, but every lesson of history tells us the greater risk lies in appeasement. And this is the specter that we face. You and I know and do not believe that life is so dear and peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery. If nothing in life is worth dying for, when did this begin? You and I have the courage to say to our enemies, there is a price we will not pay. There is a point beyond which they must not advance. And this, this is the meaning in the phrase of Barry Goldwater's peace through strength. Winston Churchill said, the destiny of man is not measured by material computations. When great forces are on the move in the world, we learn we're spirits, not animals. And he said there's something going on in time and space and beyond time and space which, whether we like it or not, spells duty. You and I have a rendezvous with destiny. We'll preserve for our children this, the last best hope of man on earth, or we'll sentence them to take the last step into a thousand years of darkness. We will keep in mind and remember that Barry Goldwater has faith in us. He has faith in you and I to have the ability and the dignity and the right to make our own decisions and determine our own destiny. That path, the path of standing and fighting for freedom, even when it seems daunting, even when it seems the gestalt of the moment, is on the other side is a path with many honorable forebears. And I can tell you, speaking and echoing the sentiment of the millions on Twitter, of the people following this Stand for Principle tonight, that if the 100 senators of this body stand together and say, regardless of party, Liberty will always prevail. Regardless of party, the Constitution is the governing body, the governing document in this nation. And we will be doing our jobs. And I commend you, Senator Paul, for a lonely stand that as the night has worn on has not proven quite so lonely. And indeed, were you the only senator standing at his desk this evening, 
It would not be lonely in that circumstance either because you would be standing shoulder to shoulder with millions of Americans that do not wish the federal government to assert arbitrary power over our lives, over our liberty, over our property, but who instead want a government that remains a limited government of enumerated powers that protects the God-given rights each of us is blessed to have. And the question I ask of you What, in your judgment, is America without liberty? Who are we if we are not a free people? Mr. President, I want to thank the gentleman from Texas for his remarks. and I think he's hit it exactly on the head, and the question is a very pertinent question. The question is really, where do we go from here? I see this as a struggle. I see that we're engaged in an epic struggle, but it's not a struggle between Republicans and Democrats. It's a struggle between the President and the Constitution. The question is, does the President have the power and the prerogative to have his way regardless of the Constitution? The question is, does the Attorney General get to say that he will adhere to the Fifth Amendment when he chooses to? Is there a choice for American citizens on American soil that they either get the Fifth Amendment protections or they don't get the Fifth, Fifth Amendment protections? So this really is a struggle, not only between the President and the Constitution, but between the Senate and the Congress and the President to say whether or not the President gets to determine this policy or whether this is a policy that should come from Congress. I think we should be asking not just for the president to give his memos on drones, we should be giving him our memos on drones. We need to be dictating the law to the president and not acquiescing and giving the president this authority. This should be a battle between the executive and the legislative. It should involve Republicans and Democrats trying to restrain the president from saying that he has the ability to decide when you get Fifth Amendment protections and when you don't.